Jesus said the same thing. This last will and testament, he said the same heart. Go and be my disciples and then make more disciples. Today, we're going to look at his heart, John 10. We're going to look at John 10, Jesus' heart for us, that he's called as his sheep, and his heart for others who have not yet come to treasure him. And so challenging, it's challenging because we're in John 10 this morning, but unlike with Luke, we don't just get to look at nine chapters of John that led us to this point. And so I want to do something maybe a little different because I want to read the last part of the section we're in. We're going to be in John 10, so, so crack open a John 10, and I want to read the last few verses, 19 to 21. We're going to go 1 to 21. But the very tail end of this section, there's a response to the words of Jesus. And its context is set in chapter 9, where Jesus has just healed a blind man and then rebukes the Pharisees, and they hear it, and so they say, are you calling us blind? And then for these next 18 verses, he begins to share about... Uh, who he is, and here is the response at the end of that interaction. There was again division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And so there's a polarizing response to the words we're going to hear this morning. That Jesus demonstrates his heart for those who he's called and his heart for those who have yet to treasure him. And then in this section, we feel this great weight of how Jesus accomplished the calling of his sheep. He tells us, because I could die for you, but I couldn't bring myself back to life after doing so. Jesus says this, In the midst of this section. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay my life down that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. So this morning we're going to hear the heart of Jesus. This compassionate heart for those he's called as well as those who have yet to treasure him. We're moving in to this living proof of a loving God with our hearts. And so I want to read, it's a big text, but I want to read it together. John 10, 1 to 21. So I'll read it as you follow along in the ESV in front of you, or in whatever version you have, or on your iPad or tablet or uh, phone that you have. John 10, we're going to hear the great shepherd's voice and his heart for those that he's called and those who have yet to treasure him. Here's what Jesus says in the context of that division. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes in before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying, so he doubles down and gives another story. So again, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I, on the other hand, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. 
I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my my Father. And there again, a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And so we heard last week this great commission, this call to commission us in our heads, our understanding. This morning we move to our heart, Jesus' heart of compassion for us and for those that have yet to treasure him. This world is filled with competing voices. There's nothing sweeter than hearing and following the voice of Jesus overflowing through his children to draw others to himself. And, and so I want to give a, a, a big picture of the flow we're heading to. It's in your bulletin. But here's our heart. The world is filled with competing voices. There's nothing sweeter than hearing and following the voice of Jesus overflowing through his children to draw others to himself. And so we're going to move from verse 1 to 6 where we're going to hear Jesus gathering his sheep who know and want to follow his voice. And then he continues where he describes himself as the only door to the unshakable joy and abundant life found in him. And then he moves to, I think, a a pretty challenging idea. And when we get there, we'll sit in it for a minute. Jesus is committed to invite more into the free, deep, joyful love he's already shown us. So pray with me and and we uh, we will dig in to John 10 together. Jesus, you are so kind. You are the great shepherd. May, may we hear your voice. May those who treasure you hear the, sweet, the sweetness of your voice calling us further up and further in. And, and if there are those that have yet to treasure Christ, that they will hear your voice this morning. They will hear your voice calling them in John 10 that you are the great shepherd. You are the gatekeeper that we enter into this abundant life in and through you. So reveal yourself this morning. Ah, as we walk through John 10, always for your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. So Jesus gathers his sheep and we know and follow his voice. And wouldn't you know it, this is where Jesus starts. There are other voices trying to lead the sheep away from his. Does that feel familiar? Does that feel true to our world and our experience? Here's what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold, but by the door, but, 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 but <laughs> sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. There are some who are attempting to drift and divert those sheep. There are other voices competing for our attention and our affection. And yet Jesus continues and says, he is calling his sheep and they know his name. Jesus is calling the church to himself. Here's what he says. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. What I found interesting about this is he knows his sheep. By name. And he calls them. Jane, he calls you by name. Not some abstract, amorphous, like, hey, come and follow me. But he turns and he says, Ricky, come follow me. He knows our story. He knows our life. And he invites us into life in his name. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own. And I can't help but think of my kids. It was school starting just a few weeks ago, right? Do you guys all take like a preschool photo? Is that something you guys do in your world? You hold the little thing. And so we got all our kids uh, on our doorstep and then Eden, she's not actually going to school, but she couldn't help herself. She just wanted to get in the photo. And, and what I love, if I walk into a room, if I come home after work, I might introduce myself and then I hear this little voice. Dada, dada, dada. What is that? She recognizes my voice. 
She understands the voice of her dad when I enter a room and she then wants to find where I am in the house. Probably you guys, when you go to a sports game, and so I've been coaching, I coach basketball. Some of you parents get a little too riled up and your kids do hear you shouting their name and we're trying to encourage you, maybe quiet down just a little bit, but what do your kids hear? They hear your voice and they know your name. (laughs) They recognize that's mom and dad cheering for me. Put your head down, put your elbow up, whatever it might be. Shoot a little bit cleaner, steal the ball. They hear your voice and they want to find you. If you're in a large crowd and you're yelling for your kids, they hear your voice because they hear other voices in a room. But who do they follow? Yours. I think of this. I just went fishing with my dad in Iowa, Grant County, out on the Blue River. And I know what some of you musky fishermen are thinking. You're like, what a little petite fish. That's what you're thinking. You're like, what kind of fish is that? But for trout fishermen, the art of fishing, I don't know what you guys, you bass fishermen just kind of yank fish in. It's not, not even a sport, right? There's an art to fly fishing. And I was trying to figure out what illustration could I do to throw in this picture. So mom and dad are here this week. We went to Iowa Grand County out to the Blue River. And that's a decent sized trout, about 17 inches. But I remember growing up fly fishing with dad. And and so when we'd be out on the river somewhere, even if I wasn't within maybe sight distance, I could hear dad's voice, right? Put your rod tip down. Send the line out. There's fish over there. And I would recognize and follow his voice. I mean, I think that's true what Jesus is saying. He's saying, my sheep know my voice and I call them by name. He knows our stories. He's gathering his people. And yet as he spoke those words to the Pharisees, how did they respond? They didn't understand. He says that in verse six. Here's what he says. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying. And so he tries again to help them see and hear who he is. And now he moves to another story. He now describes himself as the door. He's the only door to this unshakable joy and abundant life found in him. Not just going through hell so you can someday get to glory, but Jesus describes the abundant life found in him. And he first starts as seeing himself as the only way. He says, there's one door. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. There's one door and it's me. There's only one way to this life and life abundant. And there are going to be other voices competing. And yet there's one door, he says. And then there's an understanding when we know Jesus' voice. We're not going to fall for other voices. Here's what he says. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Does it feel like there's competing voices for your attention and affection from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed? That there is other voices vying for your attention, and yet Jesus says, Those who treasure him don't fall prey to those other voices because we hear his voice. And it's not just going through hell to a state of glory. He gives us a beautiful picture here. And it's one that most people will tat on their arms is this quintessential verse. Here's what he says. He's going to tell us he leads us to the abundant life and that there's nothing better than life in him. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And I think what we hear in that is safety and protection for all eternity. If you come to faith in Christ, there is a promise of safety and security. And is that true? Yes. (laughs) That there is one door and the way to life is through faith in Christ. He is the door and there is safety and security. Much like sheep in a pan, they found safety and security. But does he stop there? And maybe your preconceived idea is you're going to float off in a cloud someday and play a harp and sing songs for eternity. I think there's much more than that. But sometimes when you hear saved, that might be the extent of it. And yet Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. 
Christ by following his voice today. And, and so what it feels like in this living proof, we disconnect our heart from that process. We have our understanding of who he is and we almost skip over the emotions and we jump right to the hands. And so I, I want you to hear a quote from a guy named Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Does that mean anything to anybody? He's like an old English preacher from the 60s. Right when England was starting to change and turn, he had a compelling call to the church then. I think it's incredibly true for today. We often bypass over these emotions and immediately go to the hands. We hear God's commission, we understand the life, and we bypass that abundant life he's offering here was, and if you want the book, I would love, I would love it. it. This is what, you guys allow me to do this. It fascinates me. So I was tinkering around with this earlier this week. And so I just p- picked out, pulled out a couple quotes. Important. Then that we should be delivered from a condition which gives other people looking at us the impression that to be a Christian means to be unhappy, to be sad, to be morbid, and that the Christian life is one who scorns, delights, and lives laborious days. Christian people too often seem to be perpetually in the doldrums and too often give this appearance of unhappiness and lack of freedom and of the absence of joy. There is no question at all but that this is the main reason why large numbers of people have ceased to be interested in Christianity. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of, and you can hear talking yourself as preaching the hope of Christ to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you in the moment you wake up in the morning. Because I would imagine for many of us, what's the first thing we do in the morning? Coffee. Coffee's a great way to start the day. (laughs) I imagine for many of us, we reach for our phone. And we can't help but begin this endless and mindless scroll. Instead... Here's what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones suggests. He says, take those thoughts that come to you from the moment you wake up in the morning. The bombardment of all those anxious thoughts that start to creep in from the day before of whatever might be coming. Whatever bill might be there, whatever relational tension might be there, whatever busyness or productivity I have in my job. You have not originated them, but they are talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday. Somebody is talking. Who is talking to you? Yourself is talking to you. Now, this man's treatment in Psalm 42, and you could look up Psalm 42 right now and then go in a completely different direction, or you can earmark to go look up Psalm 42 at another time. This man's treatment, the psalmist in Psalm 42 was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he started preaching the hope of Christ to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, he asks. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, self, listen for a moment and I will speak to you. And these are the words he says. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. That that Jesus says, I came to give life and life abundant. And there are challenges, real challenges that we face every single day of our lives. And so I want to pause and I want to look at a few of the verses where other authors unpack what it means that Jesus came to bring this abundant life. And, and I imagine for some, this could feel challenging. But again, with fresh ears, may it land on you. What does it mean that we are commanded to be happy? The author of James, James says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produced steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Jesus says the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. But that he came to bring life and life abundant, not just in some distant glorious day in the future, but today, not in health, wealth, and prosperity, but in where? Count it all joy, my brothers, why? Because God is actually at work in the circumstances of your life, drawing you to himself to find more fulfillment and abundant life in him. Here's what the psalmist says. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you. 
Not exalt in the circumstances. Because <laughs> sometimes those circumstances aren't all that pleasant. But the psalmist cries, may we exalt in you. He continues, another psalmist, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is half joy, partial abundant life. <laughs> It says, in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my kind of lethargic experience, my exceeding joy. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones assessed England of the 60s feels like much of our evangelical world today. Then I will go to the altar of God to my exceeding joy and I will praise you with lyre, O God, my God. Paul picks this up in Philippians. Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not the desires for health, wealth, and prosperity, but rather not the alleviation of circumstances, not the alleviation of pain. And yet his presence, he will, if you're delighting in him, the shepherd, his voice, the sweetness of his voice, he promises, he promises us to meet us in that moment. Rejoice in the Lord. That is not in the indicative. That's in the imperative. Paul is commanding. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And yet the reality we understand. That's not our experience all the time. And so James encourages us to continue to press in. Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds. Why? Because you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let your steadfastness have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete. Lacking nothing. There are challenges that we are facing right now, day in, day out, and yet the promise that there is a great shepherd who knows us by name and is calling us, and he says he wants to give us the abundant life in him that we would not just be saved, but we would go in and out and find green pasture. Is that heavy? You guys doing all right? You guys with me? If you have I love talking about this stuff, right? So if you want to call, just email me. Email me at fred at hbclife.com. I'd love, I can't wait for all the emails I'm going to receive after this. But that's what Jesus is saying. He says, John 10, 10, I came to give you life. But do we also understand that there are other voices that would long for our destruction? Here's what Jesus says right in the context there. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. But there is a thief and the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You recognize there are other voices competing for your affections. We often talk about it as money, sex, and power. That there is a longing to accumulate more stuff. Money. You know who's rich? It's the person that just has a little bit more than me. There's always that need for more. And Jesus says, there is someone trying to steal your affections away. Money, sex, and power. I look around our culture and people are looking for human sexuality to fill these needs, whether it be gender-affirming surgery, whether it be same-sex relationships, whether it be this body count of living outside of the way God intended. Sometimes the brokenness of divorce ravages the relational tension. Pornography is just rampant. There's a thief in money, sex, and power coming to steal, kill, and destroy and promise the idea of life in those things. And power, does it feel like there's just this incredible tension around power dynamics that people long to vie for power? Jesus says, I came to give life and life abundant, but there is a thief that is seeking to promise something. Satan's a marketing genius and knows just where to grab our hearts. And yet, Jesus says, I know my sheep and I'm drawing them to myself. And so around here, that's our heart. We spent the past four years talking about our DNA, about our mission, vision, values, and now we're looking ahead. God, where are you taking us? And we talked about it just uh, last week. We talked about how it starts with us as everyday missionaries becoming a community that would then become a hub to see more lives multiplied, to be more everyday missionaries that would then turn into more multi-generational communities. And so I even was heard, I heard this morning, just sometimes our parking lot from first to second service is challenging. 
It's one of the factors. The kids we see here on a Sunday sometimes add some complexity with the space we have. And so we just heard from our farmer, uh, unwilling to sell us land to the east, but is happy to sell us land to the south. And so uh, we are going to continue to explore what that's going to look like. So our campus team is going to reconvene and uh, continue to explore what would be best for us to continue to be this hub. What does it look like for Hillcrest, who has a heart to see more lives, find life in the abundant life in Christ? That is where we continue to move. And Jesus says, <laughs> he leads to the abundant life, nothing better. There are other voices leading us away from that. And then here's the beauty of what he promises. This is for everyone. He gathers his sheep. He is the only door to the abundant, unshakable, joy-filled life. And he's committed to invite more into this free, deep, joyful love. So we got one more heavy doctrinal idea. Are you ready for this one? Because it's in there. Thank you, Jeff. It's in here. And, and, and so we're going to walk through. But hear this. Jesus is committed to invite more into the free, deep, joyful love he's already shown us. And his sheep are desperately dependent for more of him. Here's what Jesus says. So Jesus again said to them, pick it up at verse 12. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. We are desperately dependent to hear Jesus' voice so that we not fall prey to another voice that would scatter at the, at the drop of a hat. We're desperately dependent to hear Jesus' voice and follow his. And he continues, when others flee, the method Jesus chose, he laid down his life. The way he chose to gather his sheep is so counterintuitive. He lays down his life. When the wolf snatches others and scatters them, Jesus, on the other hand, says they flee because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. The way Jesus draws his sheep to himself is by coming to earth as a man living a perfect life, accomplishing what no man could do, and then lays his life down so that we could find life in him. He accomplishes that freedom from sin and guilt. And he says, I lay my life down. And, and how does he gather his sheep? Read the next verse. What emotion bubbles up in your heart? Because it's probably a similar emotion what I feel. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. How's Jesus gathering his sheep? Yeah. And can they resist that? <laughs> what bubbles up in your heart possibly is that doesn't feel fair. <laughs> what do you mean Jesus has sheep and he must have them? Jesus is sovereignly gathering his sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. There are those that have yet to treasure Christ that Jesus says they are my sheep. Do we know who they are? No. Does Jesus know who they are? Yes. <laughs> And what does he say? I must bring them. Like I, I, I should think about bringing them. I should consider that maybe I'd like to have them. I must bring them also. And there's a chance they might hear me. <laughs> there's a possibility. There's a, a kind of a... a you know, uh, a 50-50 chance that they might respond. What does he say? They will listen to my voice. And so what starts to bubble up in your heart? If it's something like mine, you, you might go, that feels unfair. Doesn't everybody have a choice to respond? And, and isn't that how it works? Like Jesus, isn't that our mission statement that we're people helping people find life with Jesus? So maybe there's a chance where this unfairness starts to bubble up. I, I want to read a few uh, things from a guy named Todd Chapman, my father-in-law, that I got to serve with for a little bit. And, and he worked through four different ideas on how we can work through what this feels like. And the first one is this. 
there's just, there's just a preponderance of biblical evidence. So I, I just want to read a few verses, and then the few other ideas I'll, I'll quote, they're in these verses, but just feel the weight of, of what's going on when Jesus says, I'm sovereignly gathering my sheep, that I am unaware of who they are, but Jesus says, I must have them. Paul picks up this idea in Ephesians. Here's what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Every time I see that word of adoption, how many of my kids did we choose? Three. How many were, were a surprise to us? One. There you go. Every time the idea of adoption comes, I feel the weight of what God has done for us. Independent of anything my kids did, we chose them to be a part of our family. And we are incredibly thankful that they are a part of our family. I look at what God has done for us. He's called his sheep and he's adopted us into his family. It wasn't just some wild night mom and dad had after a date night, right? There's, there's actually a deep, intimate adoption for three of my beautiful babies. And the fourth we love as well. But that weight of adoption comes home. Paul continues in Ephesians, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Romans 8, here's what Paul tells us in Romans, and maybe someday we'll get to Romans and we'll go through it in about five years. And we, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, the sheep that hear his voice, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, he must have. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, there's some day of a promise of being glorified. And then in John, Jesus tells us again, in the very next text after the one we're reading, here's what he says. At the time of the feast of dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking into the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Christ? Tell us plainly, and it's what he's, it's what he's doing right now. He's saying, I am the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. I am the door. My sheep enter through that door. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. And you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because why? Because you're not among my sheep. He continues. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Just earlier in John 6, we feel the tension and Jesus brings that tension to our life. Don't I make real decisions in this life? Didn't I make a real decision? You did. You made a real decision to be here today. Did you make a real decision to choose Jesus if that's true of you? Yes, you made a real decision. Jesus invites us into that tension. Here's what he says. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, whoever comes, whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe why? Because all that the Father gives me will come to me. <laughs> and without skipping a beat, feeling the tension, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone, absolutely anyone, Anyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And then what happens? 
And no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We sit in that tension. There is a preponderance of biblical evidence. And yet, do you believe in the Trinity? How's that work? I don't know. Do you believe that there was a God? I believe this. There was a God who became man and dwelt among us. How's that, how's that work? I don't know. That God somehow says, I'm sovereignly calling my sheep and they hear my voice. And yet Jesus simultaneously says, whoever will can come. There is a preponderance of biblical evidence. And the second reason we can lean in that Todd was describing, lean into this. There's a growing realization of my guilt and God's holiness. Do I recognize the guilt that is due my life and yet the incredible sense of God's holiness for that righteous payment? Or do I scoff at that and say, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. A realization of my growing guilt and God's holiness. And then third, a recognition of my intellectual arrogance, he says. That I think, you know, I have this thing pretty much dialed. I move around, I make decisions, it's how it works. And yet, a hundred years ago, we had no concept of galaxies. There's an intellectual arrogance of humans to say, I understand how this thing works. But even all three of those, there's still a sting of what? It just doesn't feel fair. How's that work? Because that doesn't feel fair to me. It's this fourth one that Todd shared that struck me. Why would God choose to share this behind the curtain view for us? What's he trying to do? He gives us these words in order to deepen our understanding and experience of his love. I know my sheep and my sheep hear my voice. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. Do you feel the overwhelming weight that he knows us by name and no one would snatch you out of the Father's hands? He's gathering his sheep. And how he does it? Did it surprise him? Did this catch him off guard? He tells us he lays down his life and takes it up again. And there's no surprises and it's all authority. Here's what he says. And if you'd like to have a follow-up conversation about that, I would happily look forward to that conversation. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay my life and that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. Jesus willingly went to the Christ to reconcile humanity to himself, and he gives us a peek behind the curtain to give us a fuller understanding of his love for his sheep. Do you believe he calls his sheep by name? So Monday's coming. Monday matters around here to us. That there is a full week ahead of us, and so I have some encouragements that we hear from John 10. Living proof of a loving God from our head to our heart and understanding of the compassion we've received. There is no sweeter voice than hearing Jesus. His voice is the sweetest, most beautiful thing in this life. It might not be our experience every day, but we keep leaning in to hear the shepherd's voice in the midst of competing voices. And when we hear his voice, it actually frees up everything else in this life to be beautiful. When I go fishing with my dad, I'm enjoying the sweetness of Jesus' voice. When I go coach on the soccer field, assistant coach, there's a sweetness in Jesus' voice. And simultaneously, I'm reminded not everybody hears that. We went to Spring Green to House on the Rock, and we observed someone's hobby of just accumulating a bunch of C R A P. And then he dies, and what happens to that stuff? Becomes a tourist trap in Wisconsin. When we consume our lives outside of the shepherd's voice, 
those other things aren't beautiful. They become disastrous, disastrous, disastrous distractions. But in light of the beautiful voice, it allows us to enjoy whatever hobby you enjoy. And I hope you all have some hobbies. It actually makes all those things beautiful. And it produces a humility and compassion in our life when we hear Jesus' voice, that great shepherd. And it propels us to actually be living proof. When we feel the weight of that compassion, it actually sends us. Now, I don't know where your heart went in that moment. Here's at least where I would imagine it could have gone. Are we grateful and excited to be used as living proof to introduce others to Jesus? Maybe not always. If that's true of you, ask yourself why. Why might I not be grateful and excited to see the call of Jesus? I have other sheep not yet of this fold. I must have them. And how do they hear Jesus' voice? Through people. Through people helping people. But your heart might have went to a place of I'm not all excited about it. My encouragement, don't beat yourself up. We don't beat ourselves up that somehow we haven't arrived. Instead, we keep leaning in and what it means to be living proof. And I think it starts simply by meeting people where they are, modeling the impact Jesus is having on you. Much like the Martin Lloyd-Jones quote, when people observe the life of those that treasure Jesus, what's the primary way and lens they view them? Angry? Bitter? Malcontent? Or do they look and go... There's a great shepherd that they lean into and hear his voice and the sweetness of the way they interact with me. And then maybe taking it a step further, we become aware that every encounter is an opportunity to be living proof and share Jesus, sometimes even using words. And then to take it a step further, don't be content, but actually believe that we take every opportunity to talk about Jesus. We're not afraid, we're not pushy. And we start by asking questions, by being curious, by sparking curiosity. To be living proof of a loving God. And then, the challenge, which Jesus alerts us to, despite the sweetness of his voice, still many miss or reject him. And the great shepherd is calling his sheep, and yet many miss the sweetness of his voice. I hope here's the encouragement. He's always working through us. He's always working through his children to draw others to himself. And so we go with confidence because do we know which sheep he's called? (laughs) No. Might we have an assumption? That might be unwarranted given some of the lives have been drastically changed when Jesus has gotten a hold of their life. And so when we go through this life, here's my encouragement. We get so uptight. We get so wound up about what might be happening. Do we look back and remember the person God used to draw us to himself? We wake up and we're like, oh, I got all this stuff going on. I reach for my phone. What's talking to you? What's preaching to you? Do we actually relax and believe God is in control? And that he's drawing people to himself and he's using us. And so I want to pray this over us. And then I want to show a video of a family around here that is embodying what it means to continue to lean in to be living proof. With a growing heart of humility and compassion towards those you are gathering. May this commission send us into the world today with desperate dependence on you to change hearts through the invitation to hear and follow the voice of Jesus. So, so sitting right next to my TV um, is, is this framed picture. And uh, yes, we were watching the Kansas City uh, Lions game a couple weeks ago. And man, stinking Vikings are 0-2. Just, you're going to be hearing about the Vikings, I think, all season. But right next to the TV is this quote. And uh, you can imagine I might be convicted from time to time every time I look up and see this. But you might recognize the quote at the top, maybe not the bottom. It's only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. 
comes from a poem called by C.T. Studd. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. But later in his life, he added another stanza to this poem. It's about a 40-line poem, 50-line poem. This is the most famous line. And after completing it, he added this last line, and this line floors me. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. Jesus says, I came to give life and life abundant. And there are so many voices vying for our attention and our affection. And we lean in to the great shepherd to hear the sweetness of his voice. And we live for him knowing that he has other sheep.